I'm talking about holy places, um, and this is obviously a huge topic. All cultures, as far as I know, have holy places. Even atheist regimes like the Soviet Union had their holy place. They had the mausoleum of Lenin in Red Square, where the people went on pilgrimage, uh, communist pilgrimages, atheist pilgrimages, uh, to visit the tomb of Lenin, rather in the same way as people would visit the relics of saints. So even in, in cultures where there's uh, an explicit denial of the sacred um, and of the holy, uh, the need for holy places emerges. All our ancestors were hunter-gatherers, and hunter-gatherers by their very nature move around the landscape. They have to move following herds of animals, uh, going to places where they can harvest uh, fruit and, and seeds and plants, um, and of course this changes with the seasons, so they're necessarily nomadic. And as they move through the cycles of the landscape, um, they have various reference points, places which are special and which have stories. Um, and in, among the Australian Aborigines, these journeys and the stories are sung, and they're called song lines. Um, and I think we can assume that pr practically all hunter-gatherers would have had something like this. In Europe, our hunter-gatherer ancestors in the Paleolithic, um, certainly some of them had places where they uh, carried out ceremonies that were holy places, like in those caves in Germany, Spain, and France. Um, the Chauvin Cave and Lascaux, and some, some of those caves with paintings on the wall that were almost certainly used as ceremonial centers uh, date back 40,000 years. Those are just paintings and things that have survived. Uh, there may well have been uh, other holy places for them uh, which haven't survived because they were less protected than paintings in caves. In all cultures, we find also that natural places have a numinous power that the people recognize and treat as holy places, including mountaintops, uh, springs, special trees, waterfalls, and um, caves. So there is a, a whole, all our societies are based on a background of ancient holy places that date back a very, very long time to our hunter-gatherer past. But when people settled in the Neolithic, starting around 10 to 12,000 years ago, um, they started building holy places. Well, even before that, in Turkey, uh, Gaborke Tepe, has, uh, which is before the settlement of the land, is a kind of temple complex that was a holy place that wandering people must have aggregated at uh, during festivals. Um, but the, uh, when people settled, then they started uh, building uh, or creating uh, human-made uh, holy places. These included standing stones or megaliths and stone circles and also wood circles and wooden poles. In the Old Testament, we read about the Asherahs, these uh, poles sacred to the goddess that were found in many uh, holy places in, in Palestine. And then uh, people started building temples, and um, we see temples in ancient Egypt, in Sumeria, in Babylonia. Um, and these were more urban-centered uh, holy places. In fact, cities were consecrated as holy places by having temples within them. And we still have that here in Britain, where our great temples are the cathedrals. And traditionally, a city in England is defined uh, by its possession of a cathedral. It's not to do with its size. So you can have very large places that aren't cities. You can have very small places like Wells or Southall, Southwell in Nottinghamshire, which are cities because they have cathedrals, even though they're really very small towns. And it's this sacred place at the center that uh, makes them uh, a city. Uh, 
Um, in India, in South India, in Tamil Nadu, where I lived for two years, in Father Bede's ashram, um, many, there are many great temples. Madurai, for example, has a temple right at the heart of it, a temple of the goddess, Meenakshi. The whole city uh, is a pilgrim center, and the temple, the holy place, at the very center of the city. Um, so, as well as being um, places to worship the gods and goddesses, holy places also are places where the dead are buried. In our remote past, in the Paleolithic, when uh, people were moving around as hunter-gatherers, you couldn't really have burial places of a fixed kind. If the whole group is moving, they're not going to carry bodies uh, around the landscape for hundreds of miles uh, to a fixed burial place. Um, they would have had to have rather scattered burial places. But when people settled in the Neolithic, um, then burial places became enormously important. And long barrows, which we have here in England, uh, some of them dating back uh, 5,000 years, uh, as, as old as the pyramids in Egypt, um, and then later round barrows, uh, were burial places and also ceremonial centers, uh, which uh, were the focus of uh, ceremonies, uh, particularly at, at festival times. Stonehenge, um, was a, a festival center. It wasn't in the center of a city. P population density was much lower here in England. Uh, but people seem to have gathered there at key parts of the year, especially at the solstices. Uh, so um, aggregating, so coming together at holy places um, seems to have been very much part of the way they were used. Then uh, in uh, the burial of the dead forming the focus of holy places took on a new lease of life, as it were, in um, the Christian world with the relics of saints. When saints were buried, uh, uh, then they off their shrines often became focuses of pilgrimage. They became uh, special centers. And this started by about the third century AD. And Within a fairly short time, it became fairly normal for cathedral seats of bishops um, to be at the burial places of saints. And many of our great cathedrals here in England are the shrines and burial places of saints. St. Hugh in Lincoln, St. Thomas of Becket in Canterbury, St. Ethelreda uh, in Ely, St. Cuthbert in Durham, and so on. Um, So um, one of the uh, key features of holy places is that they act as um, places of mediation or connection, uh, particularly between the heaven and the earth, and also between the living and the dead. And one of the features of holy places, like um, the, the standing stones, um, is that they stick up into the sky. And one could see this as symbolic. They link the heaven and the earth. And the standing stones um, in the Holy Land, particularly Bethel, uh, were particularly important for that role. In the Old Testament, we read of Jacob's ladder, where Jacob lay down uh, with a stone for his pillar um, and had a dream of angels ascending and descending between heaven and earth, linking the heavens and the earth. And he then uh, consecrated that stone um, and treated it as a holy place. And that, uh, in the later history of Palestine, Bethel became a major place of pilgrimage and ceremony for Jewish people. So uh, uh, there's a debate about was it already a megalith uh, that he uh, slept by or did he create a new standing stone? I think it's much more likely it was already a megalith. Um, in Egypt, standing stones were made into a much more refined form uh, as obelisks, which are usually monolithic. They're a single stone with a pyramid-shaped top. 
And of course, we have one here in London, Cleopatra's Needle, on the embankment of the River Thames. Then uh, people started building towers um, in, in temples and other holy places, um, and, and then with Christian holy places, spires, and with Muslim holy places, mosques, minarets. So um, these were often associated with these vertical structures uh, that go up into the heaven and symbolize this linkage of heaven and earth, the connection of life on earth and the transcendent realm, that heavens literally transcend the earth. They go beyond the earth, and they're literally higher than the earth. Um, and I think when people thought of heaven then, they didn't think of some metaphorical uh, place, they thought of the sky. Um, and the, the sky is, after all, uh, the bulk of reality. If you think that God is everywhere, as I do, um, then uh, the vast majority of God must be in the heavens, I mean, they, they, which occupy 99.999 uh, recurring percent of the universe. Uh, the earth is a very small part of the universe, and the bulk of it is the sky. But I don't think this is just symbolic. I think it has a, a more immediate um, physical uh, realization uh, through lightning. Lightning is literally a connection of the heavens to the earth. People used to think that lightning flashes were generated by a kind of friction between clouds and the earth. But it's now thought that um, it's much more than that. Uh, people have, observe, have observed sprites, which are kind of electrical discharges moving down from the ionosphere, the very outer parts of the atmosphere, to the clouds. And the electricity in those comes from the solar wind, uh, the electrically charged plasma that uh, flows out of the sun all the time and affects the uh, magnetosphere around the Earth, this uh, magnetic envelope around the whole Earth, like a membrane around the Earth. And when there's a solar flare, uh, when there's a, a greater activity on the sun, there's more uh, of these electric currents and electrically charged particles hitting the ionosphere, causing more sprites. And when there are solar flares, there's a great increase in lightning flashes on Earth, as well as in the activity of the northern lights and the southern lights, the aurora borealis and the aurora australis. So I think that actually the energy of the heavens, literally the energy of the heavens, comes down to the earth in these holy places with towers and spires and minarets. Um, and the way that lightning works is that the, there are trailers, positively charged, what are called trailers, uh, come out from below, from the earth, come out and you can actually see sometimes sort of blue uh, things like trailers streaking up into the sky. And the lightning discharge comes down from above, and they meet. Um, but these uh, trailers and that attract the lightning accumulate in high places. So the higher the place, the more likely it is to attract lightning. And that's why towers and spires and obelisks and so on have lightning conductors on them, because they're struck by lightning much more frequently than lower buildings. And in Old, uh, old landscapes here in England, the tallest building in most towns or villages would be the church with its spiral tower. And it would literally channel the energy of the heavens into that holy place. Um, now, in cities like London, there's skyscrapers and banks and, and so on, which now capture the lightning. Uh, and it's no longer the monopoly of churches and holy places to channel it into the ground, it goes into the temples of commerce instead. Um, but it still comes into uh, towers, and I wouldn't mind betting that St. Mark's here has a lightning conductor. Um, yes, well, you see, this too would be a place where that energy of the heavens comes into the ground. Um, if I were a church warden, um, I think I'd uh, uh, strap a small lightning recording device to the lightning conductor and just make a note of how often uh, the church is struck by lightning. It's not exactly subtle when lightning 
uh, strikes something and go a huge electric discharge goes down the copper lightning conductor into the ground. And devices already exist which you can put near a lightning conductor that detect that surge of electricity. And some of them can now broadcast the information and you can pick it up on mobile phones or computers remotely. So you could be a church warden of St. Mark's and have one of these devices and um, then know when lightning struck. I'm sure that parishioners would be very interested and I, there could be a competition between churches in London to see which ones get struck most. Um, so uh, I think that, that, I mean, people pay very little attention to this, but I take it very literally that this is, this energy comes from the solar flares and some more remote parts of the cosmos and is literally coming into the ground, literally being earthed and, and connecting the heavens and the earth. Well, it's a very traditional feature of holy places that they're centers of pilgrimage. And pilgrimage, again, is a very ancient and universal human practice. In a sense, our wandering ancestors in the Paleolithic, our hunter-gatherer ancestors, um, were on a kind of perpetual pilgrimage going around the landscape between these special places that, with stories uh, that were part of their annual cycle of movement. When people settled down in the Neolithic um, and with the beginning of agriculture, um, they still went on journeys to holy places, and they, like in Stonehenge. People assembling at Stonehenge for the summer solstice would have had to walk, presumably uh, walking was the main way they got there, from a large area or all around. And they would have come together there for festivals. Um, and that was a, a kind of pilgrimage to the festival. Jesus walked to festivals at the temple in Jerusalem. Um, and we find this all over the world, this um, gathering together at many places for festivals. Um, People also go on pilgrimages at other times of the year. Um, they're often at particular times for that holy place. For example, in Ireland, Croke Patrick, the holy mountain of Ireland, almost certainly a, a holy mountain before Christianity, but Christianized um, as a result of St. Patrick and named after him, uh, has particular days when people will congregate, walk there or travel there from all over Ireland and assemble uh, and climb up that mountain, which is very hard to climb because it's full of slippery pebbles and scree. Uh, many do it barefoot um, on these particular holy days. And of course, you can go to other days as well. In India, people travel all over to the caves in the Himalayas, to the source of the Ganges, uh, to the great temples of India, uh, to the um, bathing places on the Ganges in Benares. And when I was living in India, I was very struck by the fact that all over India, you see people walking on pilgrimage. Some go on trains and buses, but the traditional way is walking. And the whole of India is crisscrossed by these pilgrimage routes. There was one near Father Bede's ashram, and, and um, I sometimes used to visit the temple there on the, a hilltop temple. Um, called Ayamalai, which was near to uh, where his ashram was. Um, and this is very, very much part of their culture. Buddhists go on pilgrimages to the holy places associated with the Buddha's life, like Bodh Gaya, uh, where he was enlightened. And in, um, in Sri Lanka, the Temple of the Tooth in Kandy is a stupa, those, those, um, those rounded structures. Uh, which is supposed to contain a relic of the Buddha's tooth. So the idea of pilgrimage to places of holy relics is very widespread. It's not simply in the Christian tradition. Um, Jerusalem, of course, is a place of pilgrimage for Jewish people, as it is for Christians and for Muslims, because the Dome of the Rock is where Muhammad is supposed to have made his night journey up into the heavens on his steed on his magical horse called lightning. Um, and as, uh, Europe and, and the rest of uh, and the Middle East was Christianized, uh, there was a, a 
building of many cathedrals and churches, many of which, which had shrines where there were relics of the saints, which became major uh, centers of pilgrimage. Here in England, in the Middle Ages, there were many, many places of pilgrimage, and it was a major part of the medieval landscape. The monasteries, which were all over the country, uh, provided the infrastructure for pilgrimage. You could sleep in monasteries, you, you could be fed there, and they provided for pilgrims on their journeys. The most famous, of course, was to Canterbury, um, the uh, pilgrimage to the Shrine of St. Thomas Becket in Canterbury, uh, was by far the biggest one, and people came there from uh, all over Europe as well as from all over Britain. And uh, uh, the Shrine of Our Lady, a Black Madonna in Walsingham, was another. The Shrine of the Holy Blood in Hales Abbey in Gloucestershire was another. Glastonbury Abbey was another major site. Um, St. Ethel Dreders at Ely, St. Hugh at Lincoln, St. Cuthbert at Durham, all of these were major sites of pilgrimage in the Middle Ages. And we know that pilgrimage was, um, it wasn't always that solemn. It was fun as well as having a serious spiritual purpose. Because if you read Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, uh, the stories that pilgrims told each other on the way to Canterbury, it's clear that not all of them were particularly pious, or at least when they were on the journey, they were having fun as well. And people didn't go on holidays then, they went on pilgrimages. So it was the main way you would travel. And when I was living in India and working there, um, most of the people who worked in my institute, I was head of a division, so they had to come and ask me to sign their leave papers. And many of the people working there went on pilgrimages to Hindu temples or to Muslim shrines like the uh, shrine at Ajmer. Um, and for many of them, that was it. They didn't go on secular holidays. They went on pilgrimages with their families. And it was, they were going to great sacred places with a purpose. Um, and they were having fun as well. Well, this was all um, very much part of the culture of England until the Reformation. And the Reformation meant there was a very radical break because the reformers didn't like pilgrimage. Um, they were quite scholarly, and many of them realized that pilgrimage had its roots in pre-Christian and pagan practices, and they were against it. Um, they were also against it because uh, the, um, the shrines accumulated great wealth, and the king didn't particularly want them to have all that wealth. And so in the Reformation, the monasteries were dissolved, and the shrines were desecrated, and all the gold and jewels and so on that had accumulated there was uh, appropriated by King Henry VIII. Um, and the pilgrimage was actually banned in 1538 by an injunction of Thomas Cromwell's, uh, an injunction against pilgrimage. It was made illegal in England. And the infrastructure was destroyed with the destruction of the monasteries. So this was a radical shift um, that until then, Pilgrimage had been part of everyone's life in all cultures. But in Protestant countries after the Reformation, in Germany and Scandinavia as well, in the Protestant parts of Germany, um, pilgrimage was banned. I think this left a great void in uh, the soul of the English. Um, and it was uh, filled uh, by the fact uh, that within a few generations, the English had invented tourism. And I think tourism is best seen as a form of secularized pilgrimage. Uh, people still go to the great holy places. Um, they still want to go to them. They're still called, they're, they're, they still have their attraction. They're called tourist attractions. You know, our great cathedrals are tourist attractions. Um, and the great holy places of India are tourist attractions. They're all uh, places that tourists want to go to. But when they go there, because they're secular, they can't actually um, do a puja or say a prayer or light a candle because they have to pretend they're modern, secular, uh, enlightened people whose primary interest is in art history. Guides spring up to tell them um, you know, all the history of the place, how many tons of stone the king built it, etc., etc., um, uh, which they're not really interested in at all. Uh, 
but uh, that's, uh, there's a kind of pretense that it's all about uh, academic type art, art history. But actually, they're there because they're great holy places. And I think it's best, better, really, to see um, tourism as frustrated pilgrimage. And I think, actually, one of the big paradigm shifts that can happen, that actually is happening today, is the shift back from tourism to pilgrimage. It's very much more satisfying to visit a holy place as a pilgrim than as a tourist. And fortunately, now in all our cathedrals, they have candle racks. You can light a candle and you can pray. And until about when I was a child, there were very few cathedrals that had candles you could light. It was considered too Roman Catholic. Now it's, it's very standard in the Anglican Church as well as the Roman Church uh, that you can light candles and pray in churches. You're always able to pray, of course, but lighting a candle gives a kind of focus to the prayer. So um, the tourism uh, is now global. It's uh, worldwide. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's now billions and billions of dollar industry. Um, but I think this reframing of tourism, uh, taking it back into pilgrimage, um, is actually the way forward. And funnily enough, tourism uh, as epitomized by Thomas Cook as the ultimate tourist agency actually started as a pilgrimage. Thomas Cook, the actual Thomas Cook in the uh, 19th century, started by organizing pilgrimages to the Holy Land. Uh, and people from England started going on pilgrimages to the Holy Land, which was really the first time people had done pilgrimages uh, since the Reformation. And once it became fashionable for the rich and influential to go on pilgrimages to the Holy Land, organized by Thomas Cook. Uh, Cook branched out into general tourism and holiday business. Uh, but the a revival of, of pilgrimage began here in Britain. In the 19th century, um, uh, there were a few people who started doing it again. The shrine at Walsingham was revived at the beginning of the 20th century and is now a major focus of pilgrimage. Um, and uh, the, in more recent years, there's been a, a massive revival of pilgrimage um, in Europe, starting really in the 1980s uh, with Santiago de Compostela. And when the route was reestablished in the 1980s and a group of enthusiasts created the infrastructure where pilgrims could stay and get fed on the, when walking to Santiago on the Camino, uh, well, there are several Caminos, some from France, some from Portugal, some from Spain. Um, uh, when the infrastructure was established and, and the first fairly large-scale pilgrimage began around 1987, 1,000 people walked to Santiago to Compostela. In 2019, just before the COVID, 330,000 walked to Santiago, many of them atheists, or agnostics, or people who... Uh, consider themselves non-religious, um, uh, that the pilgrimage is an expression of being on a spiritual journey. And many people now are on a spiritual journey. And pilgrimage uh, is a wonderful way of actually embodying that process. Here in Britain, uh, there's been a revival of pilgrimage too. And the, this is being coordinated by the British Pilgrimage Trust, of which I'm a patron. Um, uh, one of the projects is, is flagship project is the reopening of the old way to Canterbury from Winchester or Southampton. Um, it's a 19-day route over the South Downs, taking in dozens of village churches, several cathedrals, including Chichester. Um, and the British Pilgrimage Trust is at present working with people in villages and local authorities and so on to set up the infrastructure because if people are going to walk there, they've got to sleep somewhere and eat somewhere. And if you're well off, of course, you can stay in Airbnbs and pubs. But for 19 days, uh, that's a lot of money if you're not that well off. So the idea is to uh, have places where people can sleep much more cheaply, new campsites, uh, church halls, and indeed many actual medieval churches are now opening for people to sleep in them. This was pioneered 
by Peter Owen Jones in his uh, parish church of Firle in Sussex. And now he's the go-to person for vicars who say, well, people want to sleep in the church. How do you do it? What do you do? Well, he's, he's now had quite a number of groups sleeping there. And this is uh, now becoming a, a, a new way of using underused village churches. Um, there's also a, a growing movement towards praying in or meditating in holy places. I mean, of course, churches traditionally have church services, and, uh, and church services have a major role to play, obviously. I'm, I'm a regular church goer myself. I'm not against services at all. Um, but I think many people overlook the fact that churches are uniquely quiet places, and they're places where there's been a spirit of prayer over many centuries, often very conducive to meditation. And a few months ago, I had the uh, privilege of going to Bakewell in Derbyshire, where I visited uh, John Butler. You probably know of his, yes. Well, John Butler is a, a retired organic farmer who lives near Bakewell or in Bakewell. He used to farm near there in Derbyshire. Um, he's now well into his 80s. But for the last 25 years, John, John Butler has been going to Bakewell Parish Church for two hours every morning and two hours every evening, where he sits quietly in the chancel, on, a, on, a, on his seat in the chancel, and he meditates four hours a day in the parish church there. And uh, I visited him there and meditated with him, and it was a wonderful experience. He, he's primarily influenced by the Russian tradition. He lived in Russia for a while, and he mainly uh, uses the Jesus prayer. And while I was meditating with him there, I found myself uh, moving from the mantra I usually use, which is the one that we did together this evening here. Um, uh, I found myself uh, changing track and going on to the Jesus prayer, which I used to do years ago. Um, I didn't know at that time that's how he meditated. And I, my wife, Jill, also found herself doing the Jesus Prayer. and um, I asked him afterwards, and he said, yes, that's how I meditate. And um, So he sort of induced the Jesus Prayer in us. Um, the, so the, I've since, inspired by John Butler, I've, I find that um, going and praying and meditating in churches is very helpful. I actually make a practice of, all through lockdown, of going to our local parish church, Hampstead Parish Church, and praying there at least once a week in the church when it's in the daytime, when it's very quiet, there's no one there. I find it very conducive to prayer and to meditation. Um, and so I think that our churches are very underused from that point of view. Some village churches have now started quiet times, one hour periods when people can pray in silence or meditate can gather together and do it together. And I think that's something that could be much more widely practiced um, because there they are. They're, some of them are only used for a service once a month. They're greatly underused, and yet they have this tremendous power and peace. One aspect of holy places is that they have a kind of memory, and I think that's one of the reasons that they're holy in the way that they are. Um, because they have, uh, I think when we're there, we sort of tune into the memory of those who've been there before. One of my scientific um, theories it concerns morphic resonance. Morphic resonance is a memory principle in nature. I think the whole of nature has a kind of memory. Um, I think the so-called laws of nature are more like habits. Um, this uh, principle... Um, it's testable scientifically. There's already evidence supporting it. It's quite controversial within science, need to say. But um, it, I think, makes a great deal of sense, a better sense of the universe uh, having an evolving universe with evolving habits rather than the standard view, which is that the universe began uh, with a big bang 13.7 billion years ago when all the laws of nature were fixed like a kind of cosmic Napoleonic code in a mysterious and unexplained way. Um, and I think this memory principle is inherent in everything. I think 
every species, every animal species has a collective memory, every plant species has a memory of form, a collective memory of form. Humans have a collective memory, and that's what Jung called the collective unconscious. And morphic resonance depends on similarity. The more similar you are to something, a situation in the past, the more similar an organism is, or the more similar the situation is, the greater the resonance. I think that's why rituals uh, in all religions are conservative, because if you do the ritual in a similar to the way to the way it's been done before, it's more likely to resonate with those who've done it in the past, bringing the past into the present, and connecting the present participants with those who've done it before. And I think when you enter a holy place, like a cathedral or an uh, Indian temple, or one of the great mosques or tombs, um, then uh, you tune in to the memory of previous people who've been in that place, many of whom have prayed there, some have had visions there, some have been inspired there, some have been healed there. Um, and I think that that memory in the place is something we can draw on. It's one of the things that gives holy places their power, um, that we're tuning into a kind of memory that's built up over time. Some holy places are probably naturally holy, like mountaintops and springs and waterfalls and so on. But some are made holy, some are human-made, and I think their holiness accumulates over time as a result of what's happened there in the past. And so by praying in them, we both benefit from uh, that which has happened there in the past and contribute to it by making it more likely that others will be able to tune into this uh, when they visit it uh, in the future. There's another aspect of holy places which is very little explored in the modern world, and that is dream incubation. Probably you've heard the phrase dream incubation, uh, but if you haven't, what it is is sleeping in a holy place um, and asking for a healing dream or an inspirational dream. And this is something that's been going on for a very, very long time. Uh, in ancient Greece, at the Temple of Aesculapius at Epidaurus, uh, the god of healing, near the Holy of Holies was a kind of area with beds in it. And people would worship in the temple, give thanks to the god, and then sleep uh, in the, near the Holy of Holies uh, with the hope that they'd have a healing dream, and apparently many did. And this idea of healing dreams or inspirational dreams in holy places is very widespread in different traditions. When I was living in Hyderabad in India, um, some of my Muslim friends took me to the shrine of a, a Sufi saint called a Daga. These shrines of saints are called Dagas. And this particular Daga was famous for its uh, power of healing dreams. And in the courtyard around the shrine, there were groups of families who'd gone there to support one of the family who was mentally troubled. And they slept there. The whole family would sleep there with that person. And they'd, they'd pray for a healing dream. And many of them did have dreams. The saint would appear to them in the dreams and uh, tell them something or just be there with them or uh, in other ways uh, had a healing effect. And many people were convinced that they were cured and healed through these dreams, through dream incubation. So this is a living practice in modern India, in the Muslim tradition, but also in the Greek and uh, Orthodox, other Orthodox churches, it, it's a living tradition, particularly in churches dedicated to St. Cosmo and Damien. Um, uh, people sleep in those churches for healing dreams. They're the healing saints, they're twin saints who are uh, doctors and healers. Um, so I think now that people are sleeping in churches as part of pilgrimage, the whole issue of sleeping in a church is no longer fraught with problems. How could you get to sleep in a church? They're locked at night. There are lots of people now doing it anyway as part of uh, pilgrimage, as I mentioned earlier. And I think that a new frontier here in Britain would be dream incubation. I mean, it's possible 
that even in, 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 in not inconceivable that the Christian Meditation Center could lead one in St. Mark's. Um, I've tried it out in uh, some London churches. Um, of course, you have to have a vicar who's friendly and doesn't mind, and there have to be toilets on the premises, which there are here. So um, um, the um, experimental dream incubation, I think, is one of the new frontiers in uh, spiritual development. Um, I'm a great believer that in the principle we have to rediscover and reinvent and evolve these practices. And there are very good biblical precedents for this uh, as well. Not only did Jacob and his ladder, by sleeping in what was already a holy place, have this dream of angels, but King Solomon himself, um, the epitome of wisdom in the Judeo-Christian tradition, gained his wisdom through dream incubation. We read in the Old Testament that in the book of Kings, that King Solomon, when he was a young man, um, went to the shrine of Gibeon, which was a pre-Jewish shrine in a high place. It was one of these hilltop shrines. And there he made sacrifices on the altar and then slept there in that holy place. Uh, for a, It was a dream incubation practice. And in his dream, God appeared to him and said to him, my servant Solomon, what do you want of me? What would you like to ask of me? And Solomon replied, give me an understanding heart. And God said, well, because you asked for this and not for wealth and power, not only do I give you an understanding heart, but also wealth and power will be added to it. And so the wealth, the power, and the wisdom of Solomon, uh, according to the biblical account, came through this dream. Uh, the, uh, this dream incubation practice at a holy place of Gibeon. So um, I think that uh, that's something that it is uh, something that could well be explored uh, more widely. And I think one place where it might work well is in um, the ruined abbeys. Sleeping outdoors under the stars is very powerful. And there are all these ruined abbeys, um, like Glastonbury and, and Revo and Jervo and Hales, um, uh, which are under the care of English heritage. English heritage is desperately trying to find new ways of making these ancient sites more attractive. It's trying to shake off the old Ministry of Works uh, sort of ethos of you know, just keep off you know, the, the archaeological site, etc. And, and um, at the British Pilgrimage Trust, we've suggested that they include those in pilgrim routes, which has now been done in English heritage handbooks. Uh, they've now linked them in through with the British Pilgrimage Trust to pilgrimage routes. And we're suggesting to them that they now start facilitating dream incubation within uh, these ruined abbeys. They've already started in some of them a quiet hour, and now before closing, they've asked people to be there in quietness, so people can actually tune into the atmosphere in a meditative way, rather than simply treating it as a tourist site, which you walk around and uh, look at a few signs about archaeological uh, remains. So the, there are many possibilities uh, here for increasing the um, way in which we can appreciate and respond to holy places. There's a couple of more, more points I want to make here. Um, one is that holy places don't necessarily have to be somewhere else. They can be in one's home. And many traditional homes have holy places within them. Um, when I first went to India, I was taken up by an anthropologist friend into a remote village in the Himalayas. It was beyond the road system. There was no electricity, no television. Um, and I was staying in this very simple house. It belonged to a Brahmin family. The father was a herbal doctor, a Ved. Um, and we slept on the floor, and I was sitting on the floor. Everyone sits, sits on the floor, and there was the hearth, and there was the, the woman, the wife of the, the man of the house was cooking the meal. I had some, some rubbish in my pocket, and I was about to throw it onto the fire 
when my friend said, oh, I to save and say, don't do that. And I said, why not? He said, fire at the center of the home is the holiest place. It's the holy place, the holy hearth. You can't throw rubbish onto it. You know, that's, you have to desecrate. The, the center of the home is this fire. And Indian traveling holy men or sadhus, when they stay somewhere for the night, they, the first thing do is gather firewood and put in like their duni, their holy fire. They sit round the fire, and that fire is the holy place. In traditional Chinese and Japanese homes, they have an ancestor shrine uh, where they have the uh, give, make, honor the ancestors every day. And that's in, in many Hindu households, they have a shrine with gods and goddesses where they burn incense um, every day as a puja. Um, and in many Orthodox and Catholic households, they have icons or images of the saints or crucifixes where people pray. And I'm sure many people here have holy places in their homes where they pray and or meditate. Um, uh, so they, with it, we shouldn't forget that holy places can be quite intimate and domestic as well as um, out there in, in, in the wider world. Some people also have what are called sit spots, places in nature and outdoors where they sit and meditate. Um, and uh, this is also a very helpful practice because if you go to the same place repeatedly throughout the year, you get a much greater appreciation of the seasons and the, the, the place itself uh, rather than just going there once. You see it change throughout the year. I have one of these. Uh, places on Hampstead Heath. I live in Hampstead. and I, I, There are several quite secret places on the Heath where it's possible to be there for quite a long period without anyone coming there at all. Quite magical spots. Another way of um, reconnecting with holy places is to turn our journeys into pilgrimages. One way is to go on an actual pilgrimage, which means you go with an intention uh, to, when you go to a holy place as a pilgrim, you go with an intention. You're going to give thanks for something or to ask for something or to um, ask for healing very often. And many holy places are places of healing, of wholeness. Holy, healing, health all come from the same root. Um, some of them are healing shrines that are primarily known for healing, like Lourdes in France with the well there, the spring. Um, so some, um, one way is to go on an actual pilgrimage. Another way is to turn our journeys into pilgrimages. And since I got interested in holy places, largely inspired by India, I have to say, it didn't occur to me really when I was living in England, although I loved going to cathedrals uh, and great churches and other and ancient sites. Um, it, I was really inspired to see it this way through living in India. And now, whenever I go to a new city or town, if I'm going to give a talk somewhere or I go to a meeting or a conference or I'm going to visit someone um, in Britain or abroad, I try and go as soon as I can to the central holy place. So if it's a city, go to visit the cathedral and light a candle and pray for blessings on my time in that place and um, blessings on the people I meet and, and on that place itself. Um, if I'm in India, I go to a temple. If I'm in a Muslim country, I go to a mosque or a dagger, a, a Sufi shrine. Um, um, if I'm in a village, I go to the church. Um, so I think visiting the holy place, or where whatever place you visit, gives another dimension to the visit. It sacralizes the visit. It connects it in a way uh, that would otherwise be just a secular visit. It doesn't take long. It's usually very satisfying to feel that you're connecting with that center of uh, that, the holy center of wherever you're visiting. And usually people are very happy when you do that. They, they welcome you and, uh, and uh, it's, it shows respect to their own tradition and their own holy place. And here in London, uh, there are many such places. And the British Pilgrimage Trust organizes pilgrimages in London. And I've been on some of them. In fact, I went on, the last one I went on 
was with my wife in our, on our wedding anniversary. We always go on a pilgrimage for our wedding anniversary. Um, sometimes we go to Canterbury. But this time we, we did a London pilgrimage. We started from you know, the, the main British Pilgrimage Trust route starts near the Tower of London um, at All Hallows by the Tower um, and then goes to St. Magnus the Martyr and then uh, to the London Stone, an ancient stone, uh, which is in the wall of a bank now. Uh, then uh, to the Mithraeum, uh, which is an old Roman temple of Mithras, which has been beautifully restored at the bottom of the Bloomberg building, um, they, uh, from on the original site of this Roman temple. And then to St. Mary Older Mary, the oldest Marian church in London, and then St. Paul's Cathedral. Well, that's what my wife and I did for our wedding anniversary. Um, but the full London pilgrimage then goes from St. Paul's um, to uh, St. Bride's in, in Fleet Street. Um, then to the temple. The, in the inner temple, there's this crusader, this round church, um, this medieval church at the heart of the temple, which is open to the public. Um, then via Cleopatra's Needle to Westminster Abbey, where the pilgrimage ends with choral evensong at Westminster Abbey. It's the most wonderful way of re-experiencing London. I've missed out some of the places on the route. And you can do different routes in London. Another one I've done to Westminster Abbey is from St. Ethelreda's Ely Place, which is the most lovely medieval church. And uh, if you're a Roman Catholic now, or you, it, even better, you can start from St. Bartholomew the Great, which is one of the few great churches of London not destroyed in the Great Fire, via St. Ethelreda's, and then um, St. Andrew's, a Wren church, and then um, the Temple Church, and then on to Westminster Abbey. And when you do pilgrimages within London, London seems completely different. Instead of this secular city all about money and banks and business and traffic and stuff, um, you realize that London has holy places all throughout it, um, and uh, you can see it in a new way. It's very simple. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, to, to do this, and um, it, it just gives a completely new perspective. Well, the benefits of holy places, I have already mentioned, uh, the, uh, to do with um, inspiration and connection. Uh, they're about connecting. Holiness is about connection. Unholiness is about disconnection. Holiness is about connection, and that connection we get through holy places with health and well-being. So you know, it can have measurable benefits uh, to health and well-being. Um, but it's also very, very satisfying to connect with these ancient places and to feel that we're connecting. We ourselves are linking between heaven and earth and uh, the transcendent and the historic and the past and the present. Um, and these places have that to give to us. And there are hundreds of them, thousands, probably millions of them in the world. They're all around us. And when we change our perspective and recognize the possibility, the potentiality, life is quite different and I think definitely better. Um, so uh, I'm sure many of you already have holy places that are special for you. Um, and what I'm suggesting is really reaching out and looking for more. I mean, the near where you live, there may be ones you haven't yet visited. Um, and it's surprising how many people live in London have never even been into Westminster Abbey or St. Paul's Cathedral, let alone their local church. I'm, I'm always meeting people who say, oh, I've never been there. Um, as if it's only a tourist spectacle for foreigners. It's extraordinary blindness in our modern secular world. When we let those scales fall from our eyes, I think we'll all be a lot better off. Thank you. So um, I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions. And if you have a question, um, I'm just hoping that people on, can people online hear me? <laughs> I'm not sure if they can. I'll say it again in a minute for the, but um, 
Archie's got a, um, I think Archie's got a microphone. So in here, because of the people online, if you could say, ask your question into the microphone. And um, I will also just write down now in the Zoom chat so people can chat in the Zoom their questions as well. But thank you so much. That was really inspiring. I feel like I really, really want to do that pilgrimage round <laughs> all the churches starting. Mm. Yeah, I really do. Mm. Well, the British Pilgrimage Trust actually has, if you want to go on a guided one, my colleague Guy Haywood um, actually leads people on this in a group. So if anyone who wants to do it as a group, you can do that. There is a fee for that, though, but you can do it for free on your own anytime. It's helpful to do it as part of a group because then you get the hang of, and you hear the stories of the places, and it's a very, I've done it with them and without the, the group, and it's very helpful to have that introduction through uh, the British Pilgrimage Trust website, britishpilgrimage.org, has details of the routes and of when there are organized groups going. Yes, uh, Rupert, thank you for a wonderful talk, and it's wonderful that these ideas are bringing us together again after these times where we, it's the isolation has been so horrible. Um, my question was really, um, I not so very long ago heard about uh, this, this word numinosity, that the Romans actually believed that it built in things by actually doing rituals and things like that. And I've been trying to think about that, and actually do, say, in our sort of Anglo-Catholic church, I've been particularly sort of when I try to genuflect on the way back from choir to build not just because I want to be pious but also to try and build something up there to make it more more of a holy place I just wondered what your thought was on that yes well I mean the numinous is a word I mean it was a popularized really in by Rudolf Otto he wrote a book you know the, the center of the holy I think it's called um, and he popularized this word, but of course it was in widespread use before. And in, um, in, in, um, that sense of power in a place, that sense of holiness and connectedness. Well, I think, as I said in my talk, I think this is partly inherent in some places themselves, but I think it's also something that's built up and maintained and, and amplified through what we do in those places, through prayer and through ritual. Um, and that's why I think it's quite important for, to show respect to holy places and, and, and to treat them in the right kind of way. Um, so, I, yes, I think that the, there's, you know, there's a difference between churches and cathedrals where there's, uh, liturgy is regularly practiced and ones where it isn't or where the, they don't take so seriously the power of ritual. I myself personally prefer Anglo-Catholic services because I appreciate the power of ritual in the liturgy. Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, I also believe in the parish system, so you know, I usually go to our local parish church, and when I'm visiting friends for the weekend in the country, I go to the local village church, and because I think it's important, each place has its, each parish has its church, its central holy place. But I think very much the, the maintenance of these places through respect and through um, being aware of their holiness is, is a very important part of preserving and maintaining that atmosphere. Um, you mentioned Croke Patrick, uh, the mountain in Ireland, uh, as a place of pilgrimage. I was just wondering, are there any similar hills or mountains uh, in Britain to Croke Patrick that you know of? Well, we don't have many mountains in Britain, uh, but I would say that the, probably the best known would be Glastonbury Tor. I mean, that's like iconic English holy place. There you've got that flat... Uh, you know, Fenland of, around Glastonbury, and there stand this this hill that comes as so clearly visible from all around. Even if it didn't have an, a medieval tower on the top of it, it would still be an obvious and prominent feature of the landscape. 
Um, so I would say that's one. And then people actually created artificial hills. Silbury Hill in Wiltshire is, a, I mean, a mound, a very large mound, um, which was like an artificial sacred hill. Um, so, yes, I mean, some uh, traditionally all over Europe, hills, hilltops, were holy places sacred to St. Michael, usually. The angels were believed to sort of, they were portals for angels coming and going from the earth because they're the highest places. And so it's not a coincidence that the tower on Glastonbury Tor is St. Michael's Tower. And St. Michael's Mount is another example. And, and in France, of course, Mont Saint-Michel is another example. So I think one could actually point to quite a lot of examples of, of holy places on hilltops. And they're very common in other parts of the world as well. In India, many hilltops um, are holy places. And in Palestine, um, the, the hill of, of the native people, uh, the holy places were all on hilltops. Um, Sir James Fraser, in his book, Folklore in the Old Testament, uh, gives a whole list of all these hilltop shrines that were so important in the early history of the Jewish people in the Holy Land. I would, yes, I'll ask one from um, Kathy. What do you believe the memory is comprised of in holy places? Is it energy or something else? Well, I think that the, I don't think the memory is etched in the stones um, because my whole theory of memory is that it's a process based on resonance rather than being engraved in brains in memory traces or um, so I think it's a resonant process um, and I think in holy places we resonate with previous people who've been there but there's a kind of direct connection across time from them to us now all resonance depends both on form and on energy in fact everything in nature according to modern science depends on form and energy you know matter even an electron even the simplest particle of matter is a vibration of energy in a field. So what gives form in nature are fields. Uh, the gravitational field is what makes the earth and the sun and the moon round um, and what holds the whole universe together. And fields are invisible, but they create patterns or forms. We're all influenced by the gravitational field right now. Otherwise, we'd be floating around in this room rather than being uh, having weight and being pulled down um, and but energy is what gives things process or actuality so it's energy is certainly involved in the resonance process but it's energy with form it's energy with the form of the experience of that place when I go into Lincoln Cathedral for example the stained glass windows the architecture the arch is the atmosphere is similar to what other people have experienced going to Lincoln Cathedral, the same. They've experienced the same stimuli in the same places that I have. And I think I come into resonance with them. Um, and it depends on energy in the sense that everything depends on energy and our life depends on energy, but it also depends on form. And I think that this is a fundamental principle of all of nature. Actually, I think it's the fundamental principle of the Holy Trinity. I think that the, 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 the ground of being, God the Father, is the source of all things, the conscious source of all. But the, uh, the source of form in all creation is the Logos, which is the formative principle, what Indians call Nama Rupa, names and forms. Um, the Logos is formative. It's all about words, form, structure, pattern. And the spirit is the principle of movement. It's always portrayed as breath, wind, flight, fire, flames. It's the principle of change, or what in modern science we call energy. So I think actually, if we see the, uh, the way the Holy Trinity is reflected in the universe and in nature, the f energetic principle, which is in all things and is the basis of all things, is the spirit principle. And the formative or logos principle is the fields which gives things their shape, form, or structure. 
So when one has a, a memory, uh, when one tunes into this memory in a holy place, it's both energy and form. Without the form, if you have energy without form, it, it's completely structureless. Like the electricity in an electric plug, it can do anything. It can run a hairdryer, a TV set, a computer, a toaster, um, but um, it doesn't have form of its own. It's, it's sort of energy without form. And um, if you have form without energy, which then it's virtual, it doesn't do anything, it's not actual. If you have an idea in your mind, but you can't express it, uh, because it, you, it, it, like a word, you can have words in your mind which, if not expressed, don't do anything in the world. When expressed through speech, then they can do, act in the world. The form and together in speech, without the flow of breath, you could have speech and without the form of the words you couldn't have speech. The two are intimately associated every time we speak. And in fact, the Holy Trinity, I think its most fundamental metaphor is, it is the most fundamental, is speaking and words. And it happens to every one of us every time we speak, like I'm speaking now, I'm the speaker. There's the flow of the breath and there's the structure and pattern or form of the words. Thank you, Rupert. Hello. Uh, you contrast the, uh, the secular way of looking at the world with someone who has that spiritual, um, spiritual uh, way of seeing the world at the core. And I suppose this is the $64,000 question. How does that conversion take place? And it, it can, it happened to me that I began, began to see my church totally differently um, over a period of, um, well, I was an atheist for most of my life, um, but somehow I saw that building totally differently. And I just wonder if that was because I, I had this, as a child, as a, as a young person, and I'm rediscovering that, that um, th those memories. And my question is, if somebody hasn't had that background as a, as a child, ca can, you, can you get that conversion? Ca can you see that building differently, like I do? And, and I can't explain it, but it's a, it's a totally different way of seeing everything. Well, of course, there are a lot. It's an important question because the, the majority of children grow up today with no knowledge or connection, whatever, with any religious tradition. And recent surveys showed, the last survey about two years ago showed that the majority of the population of Britain described themselves as having no religion. It's the first time in history that the majority have said they have no religion. Um, and so, a lot of children know very little about it. They don't have that experience. Um, I don't know. I think this is a very interesting and important question. Um, I think that for, for a lot of young people now, I think one of the principal ways in which they undergo spiritual awakenings is through psychedelics. Um, and because psychedelic experiences put, blast people out of their normal habitual ways of thinking and usually give people a sense of the realm of consciousness being vastly greater than what they imagined. That happened to me. I was, a, I was an atheist. Um, I was a, a don at Cambridge, in, in, a science don. And um, around 1970, I took LSD for the first time. And I, for me, it was like a rite of passage, a conversion experience. Suddenly, the world looked completely different. And, um, you know, the idea of consciousness as being not just the activity of nerve cells inside my brain, which is what I believed before, but something vastly greater than my own personal consciousness and something to which I could connect through spiritual practice. I took up meditation as a result of that because I wanted to 
um, explore consciousness without drugs, you know, find other ways of doing it. But for me, that was an enormous opening. And for some young people today, grown up in a completely non-religious way, um, one way in which um, they're coming to appreciate the buildings of churches and see them as holy places is through um, an informal underground movement, Cathedrals on Cannabis. And um, the, um, I know quite a few young people who brought up completely non-religiously, who had no connection with any churches, going into Lincoln Cathedral or Wells Cathedral, you know, we're in an altered state of consciousness that enables them to drop their normal knee-jerk responses and just respond to the place as it is. The incredible power and beauty of the place, the stained glass windows. I mean, these cathedrals were designed to expand consciousness. I mean, they were certainly not utilitarian in the sense that you don't need buildings that soar up hundreds of feet, you know, just to have people singing hymns or anything. It's they were designed to expand our minds and alter consciousness and stained glass windows and tracery and all that. They're a gift of our ancestors. And that gift can be uh, reawakened in people, partly just by going there. And I think it's very difficult for anyone not to be impressed or awed by going to one of our great cathedrals. Um, and then through that learning to appreciate sacred architecture and, 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 and holy buildings, so I think that one way is to um, I mean, in touch with a number of young people who uh, give me reports on some of these experiences. Um, uh, microdoses of magic mushrooms apparently work very well in Wells Cathedral. Um, so um, there, there are ways in which people are rediscovering this in, 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 in the modern world. And I think that the you know, some people say we all have God-shaped holes, or as St. Augustine said, my soul is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Uh, young people who've been brought up non-religious, um, you know, still have that need and, 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 and want to find something that uh, beyond the normal. And for many of them, uh, psychedelics are a gateway to spirituality. For some, it can be a disaster. I'm not saying anyone should indiscriminately take them, but... Um, I have a chapter in my book, Ways to Go Beyond, called Spiritual Openings Through Cannabis and Psychedelics. Because I think for many modern people in the secular world, this is a really important way of uh, entry point. Just, uh, would you mind if I just, there's a question that's sort of going from hmm. what you're saying. Do you, do you see any contrast between being drawn to holy places and finding all places as sacred? Well, I mean, it, if one were a completely enlightened being, I think all places would be sacred. Um, I, you know, I think if one were totally transformed, you know, even car parks of supermarkets could seem sacred. But... The fact is that the, for the majority of human history, people have felt that certain places were more special than others. Um, and I myself think it's a, a, a great ideal to find all places as sacred. And one of the things I particularly like and find um, very helpful and inspiring is plants. I mean, I, I started out as a botanist, and in my book, Science and Spiritual Practice, I, I have a whole chapter on relating to plants. And for me, one of my daily spiritual practices is, is to look at plants and be with plants in my garden or house plants in, in my study. And my favorite place, in, apart from the great holy places of London, in, uh, in and around London, is Kew Gardens, where, which whenever I have a free afternoon, um, I love to go to Kew Gardens, and I, I, for me, it's just blissful being able to look at all the different kinds of plants. And, and plants are everywhere. So if one's going to look for ubiquitous uh, sort of triggers for the sense of the holy, then plants are a very good start. Animals are another. Um, I think the, one of the 
problems with the Protestant Reformation is the Protestant reformers were, had very high spiritual ideals. And they said, you know, it's idolatrous to have all these holy places that people go to and there's a special place and everywhere is holy because God's everywhere. So their argument was you don't need special holy places and pilgrimage because everywhere is holy. But it wasn't long before, as the secular world took hold, nowhere was holy. And that's the state we're in now. For most secular people, there's nowhere holy. And I, I remember there was a conflict a few years ago in Ireland uh, when they discovered that Croke Patrick contains seams of gold. And the um, uh, various influential politicians were working with gold mining companies to open up Croke Patrick as an open cast gold mine. Um, but luckily, because it's a holy place, that was stopped. I mean, nuns were sort of standing there in front of bulldozers and, and, and they protected the holy place. But that's because in Ireland there's still a sense of holy places. In North America, where the holy places were the places of the Native Americans and where the Protestant invaders and colonizers of North America didn't believe in holy places, everywhere was just real estate. Um, you know, to be exploited and nowhere was holy. Except when John Muir and the National Parks Movement came along in the late 19th and early 20th century and said, well, look, nature's holy and these national we should create national parks, basically sacred groves on, on a gigantic scale. Um, and those really are the main holy places in North America. The Spanish and Portuguese colonization of the New World was different because they did believe in holy places. And so... Um, they, but they, only, they thought they should be Christian, not non-Christian. So they Christianized the holy places. And that's why the biggest pilgrimage in the world is to the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico. Six million pilgrims a year go there. Uh, but there's no such thing in Protestant North America. Um, so, um, so I think that the... The ideal of everywhere being holy can so easily degenerate into nowhere being holy that uh, that's one reason I think it's important to maintain, uh, you know, an appreciation for special holy places. We have a mention online of Taizé in France. And... Um, could we see Taizé in France and Taizé services with its inclusion of silence as a type of pilgrimage? Well, I think we can, yes. I mean, for a lot of people, Taizé is a kind of pilgrimage. There are many, many people go to Taizé to spend time in that community where they um, sing together and have silent times together. And it's an ecumenical um, community. I've been there myself, actually. Um, for me, the big shock of Taizé, I'd been to, I was traveling with some friends and we'd been to Vézelé. We went on a pilgrimage to the shrine of St. Mary Magdalene, who's my patron saint and to whom I'm very attached, at Vézelé in Burgundy. And then we were going to Cluny, the great ruins of the abbey at Cluny. Um, and and Taizé is on, on the route. And so we stopped at Taizé. And um, I was expecting it to be wonderfully inspiring architecturally. It's not at all inspiring. They're a bit, it's, it's a bit like aerodrome hangers. You know, they're like industrial sheds. It's, a, I mean, it, it's almost aggressively unbeautiful. Um, um, and I suppose the intention was to show it's not about external forms or something like that. Um, but it's very powerful being there and the chanting and being in that community is very powerful. But it's one that, unlike most holy places where holiness and beauty are connected, in, to in Teze, there's certainly beauty in the singing, but not much beauty in the buildings. Well, have the... Yes, I was just going to send sacred architecture and I was thinking of John Michel and all his books you know in the sort of 70s I think they were mostly about um the sort of resonance again of of, of different dimensions and things like that so that would be so not not present in those hangars or 
in the Teze places, but do you, do you, what's your take on that, that sort of thing with sacred architecture and sacred geometry? Well, John Michel was a good friend of mine, and, and um, I was, you know, I loved it when he talked about sacred geometry, and I went round various sacred places with him where he'd point out the sacred geometry. And obviously, many of the great temples of the ancient world and of the Middle Ages are based on various principles of sacred geometry. One of the great examples in England is the um, in Wells Cathedral, the Lady Chapel behind the high altar is an extraordinarily complex uh, sacred geometrical structure. Incidentally, um, those of you who are into sacred geometry, uh, there's a very simple practice that I only discovered myself two or three years ago, which is that the best way to appreciate it is to lie on the floor. And um, this is um, something which, you know, I, I just didn't think you could do in cathedrals and things, that you could just go and lie on the floor. Um, I assumed that someone had come rushing to the spot and think you'd had a heart attack or something. Um, but now it's becoming more accepted. And lying on the floor in, at the east end of Wells Cathedral is a fantastic way to appreciate that sacred geometry. Um, incidentally, a number of cathedrals have now... I, the, uh, uh, I think some of our cathedrals are being very well run at the moment. And, and some of them, like Lincoln now have a special service, or not really a service, a time called sacred space. In Lincoln, they stopped during lockdown. They're just starting again. Uh, once a month, or in some places once a week, they have this time in Lincoln. It was at 7.30 in the evening. You go there at 7.30 in the evening, and the cathedral is opened up. There's no tourists. It's a period for an hour and a half called sacred space. And when I went to it there, um, you go in and there's ladies with tea and they welcome you and there's sort of biscuits and tea, very homely, make you feel at home. Then we went up to the East End and the Dean um, welcomed everyone and gave a blessing and said, blessings on your time here. And then they had various activities, some people were doing clay modeling, there was sacred Lectio Divina in one side chapel, there was meditation in another side chapel. Um, so for people who wanted to do things in the sacred space, you could do that. But if you just wanted to be there in the cathedral, which is what I wanted to do, um, you, could, you could just be there. And the, the first time they did that, the dean was actually handing out yoga mats so that people could lie down on the floor and appreciate the, the, the vaulting and the be there in, in a way that's so much more immersive. If you're lying there looking up, it's a wonderful way to experience it. Um, many cathedrals... Uh, uh, Traditionally, when you want to see the vaulting, you have to look at sort of table with a mirror on it. So looking down to look up, but it's much simpler just to lie down uh, on the floor. So I think that's a really good way of being in a sacred space. <clears throat> There's a no just one more comment, if I may, and it's from um, a group member who says, our group members often remark that their meditation is deeper in our chapel than when they meditate on their own. Is it safe to say that memory has a supportive nature with regard to spiritual practice? Memory has supported? As, um, memory has a supportive nature. Oh, yes. Well, definitely. I mean, I, I really think that. I mean, that's, I think that's why these holy places and places of pilgrimage are helpful to be in spiritually um, uh, because of this memory of what's happened there in the past. And, uh, and that's why I think it's, it's helpful to meditate and to pray in holy places. I mean, I do it at home. I pray, meditate every morning and I pray every evening. And I, you know, I do it just at home, and most of us, I'm sure, do. But when I have the chance to do it somewhere, in a, in a holy place, I do find it usually quite helpful and powerful, um, more powerful to do it there than at home, because at home I'm surrounded by so many other distractions and um, um, it's, it's harder to let go of all the sort of normal everyday concerns, whereas if I'm meditating in a 
in a holy place, then it's, it's much easier to let go of them. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Rita. That was really fantastic. And there's lots of um, time for you to write a long chat. Um, people have all listened. Thank you. Really inspiring talk. And thank you so much. Um, I'm definitely, I'm sure, going to look around and and see more than I did. And yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah, it's wonderful to see our sacred, well, our, our secular London as a more sacred place. Um, yeah. mm. So thank you very much. Mm. Good. Well. <laughs>